President Obama, I'm sorry to say, but a great man once said, what you are shouts so loudly at me that I cannot hear what you are saying. You are partially redeemable as president if in the next year you act on this road of action, but it must be well trod upon before one can feel anything other than suspicion of stark political manipulation. I'll explain why. The speech smells of posturing, of setting the table for a quick set of political moves to strengthen his power base, the Democratic Party, through faint-hearted window-dressing attempts at righting the wrongs of a country and its people and its working people and its non-working people stripped of their wealth and assets by billionaires and the like that fund both parties. Is there anything more disgusting than manipulating poverty and the poor and the nation's deep unease about becoming a giant banana republic for personal political gain? Because a gigantic banana republic we are. The U.S., according to a recent Oxfam report, which I will put in the footnotes, now leads the world in wealth inequality, especially when looking at momentum. <clears throat> Barack Obama, a man unable to run, I, I beg your pardon, a man able to run political campaigns, but unable to actually lead once in office. It is a sad spectacle, apologizing for a secret government that has run amok, turning us into self-censoring paranoids. Comparing actions of a totalitarian national security apparatus to those of Paul Revere. Was he reading Ronald Reagan's speech about the killers we trained in Nicaragua called the Contras, that is the counter-revolutionaries? With the speech that Reagan gave calling them the moral equivalent of our founding fathers, is that the speech he lifted this line from? The vast majority of scholars in history buffs steeped in the American Revolution of Lockean propositions, that is John Locke, of the natural rights of man and women, and, and the thinkers of the Enlightenment who informed and, and uh, whose ideas were seized upon by people like Thomas Paine uh, and uh, Jefferson and the rest to create our Declaration of Independence and our Bill of Rights and our Constitution. The thinkers that are aware of all of this were baffled and outraged by such a comparison to compare a massive behemoth of a national security state to the actions of our original founding fathers. Didn't Paul Revere seek to end tyranny? And if you go back to the Declaration of Independence, I think you will find we have much greater cause today to sever our ties with Washington, D.C. than the founders had to sever their ties with Great Britain. This security state he has lamely defended is a vast monstrosity. Millions of people have top secret clearances. Most of them work for private corporations. It's been privatized. The majority of it is privatized. Reading the leaked emails of some of these private security contractors, Stratfor and H.B. Gary, we learn of their plots to plant false information to destroy journalists and activists. They plan to destroy Glenn Greenwald years before he broke the Snowden story of offers to charge the Chamber of Commerce $100,000 a month to destroy their political enemies by selling them top secret government information. Additionally, another example is Coca-Cola paying for services to get secret information that is classified and held by the government to destroy PETA, the People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals. Of course, the people who exposed these horrors are languishing in prison now. In the case of Barrett Brown, who simply posted a link to where the Stratfor emails could be found, he now faces 98 years largely for posting this single link. The judge in the case's husband was a client of Stratfor, yet she has refused to recuse herself, quite happy to destroy the soul and break the will of one of the truly interesting, one of the few truly interesting and brash journalists remaining in the United States. Let us destroy him. Their surveillance state being largely privatized, suits those in government brilliantly, as they award these companies huge contracts and then go to work for them, lining their pockets, and then return to government to award them more huge contracts, and then back through the revolving door. This is a real tragedy and crime that has sped our way to being a large banana republic, the manipulation of government by powerful interests to milk it and create vast nationwide monopolies and make it very difficult for new small businesses to form. Intellectual property laws make it hard to do startups in Silicon Valley. In certain sectors, it's considered virtually impossible. The only thing you can do is immediately sell the startup. A, 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 I think they call it a, a fold-in or something like that, where you basically already have an agreement to be bought when you do your startup. 
the fox is plundering the hen house. And when Obama is not massaging the bankers and defending totalitarian surveillance, he's channeling Bush, invading Libya, murdering Pakistanis by the bushel, where the U.S. is now the most hated country in the world, according to a recent poll. So what could get worse after everything I've told you? Well, it does get much worse, I'm afraid. Michelle Obama, and you may want to read this article here. Uh, you can Google it online. Michelle Obama uh, came to California, apparently to help fight poverty and wealth inequality. But no poor uh, or even middle class people are allowed to attend. The cost of seeing her is $10,000 a seat to $100,000 a seat. The main things that she's uh, quoted as saying is, you, we need you to dig deep. We need you to max out right now. We need you to write the largest check, as big a check as you can. And who are they writing these checks to? They're writing them to other rich people, not to poor people and not to charitable institutions. It is truly disgusting. No, the tune is set. Wealth and equality. That will be the music to keep Michelle and Barack Obama as major power brokers, handing the reins to others. It is simply the musical score for attempting to return a powerful blue oligarchy to power. No discomfort will be inflicted on the wealthy and well-connected donors. People, we must begin to view inordinate wealth and inordinate power as something not to envy but to be disgusted by. We need to own our houses, have local manufacturing, perhaps more expensive than done overseas, but in the long run, it'll pay off. Pride should come from self-sufficient regions where we make the things we need to exist. We could do it 300 years ago. We can certainly do it now. And in this respect, every person will have a part to play in that community if we actually build our communities to be largely self-sufficient, relying as little as possible on imports. This isn't the only way to conduct it, but it's a decent way to go. That is true riches. Ron Paul dreamed of an America like Hong Kong. We could be so rich, he exclaimed, but we should see through excessive wealth as a sort of pornography. I very much like and admire Ron Paul, but we must find excess disgusting, not admirable. Perhaps then things might change. There was a tradition, and there still are thinkers, who value modesty, frugality, thrift, decency, and perhaps our greatest hope today in the world as a leader is actually Pope Francis. Pope Francis drives a Ford Focus. He wears uh, uh, simple clothing. He washes the feet of the poor, the unbeliever, the criminal. Where do you see such examples in recent times? His predecessor drove a custom Mercedes Benz, uh, dressed in flamboyant outfits. The Pope uh, also does not sleep in the, uh, the, the uh, luxurious quarters. He has simpler quarters. When he was Archbishop in Buenos Aires, he took public transportation. And there is a tradition of certain popes uh, to have written very interesting things about the conditions of the working class and the poor. Just as in the New Testament, this was the core of Jesus' teachings. And he took the name from St. Francis of Assisi, who got in lots of trouble for tweaking the noses of the comfortable Catholic uh, bureaucracy, shall we say. So let me quote just very briefly. On May 15, 1961, Pope John XXIII published Mater e Magistra, Mother and Teacher, and I shall post this in the footnotes, his first social encyclical. In the opening paragraph, the Pope restated the Church's right and duty to teach on matters of justice in society. He then devoted the whole of Part 1 to emphasizing that he adhered faithfully to the social teachings of his predecessors, Leo XIII, Pius XI, and Pius XII. Pope John drew attention to the teaching of Pius XI, that the wage contract should, when possible, be modified somewhat by a clear reference to the right of the wage earner to a share in the profits, and indeed to sharing is appropriate in decision-making in his place of work. Reinforcing his predecessor's teachings, Pope John wrote that it is our conviction that workers should make it their aim to be involved in the organized life of the firm by which they are employed and which they work. There are other great moral examples of leaders in the world. Pepe Mujica of Uruguay, who was shot, I believe, over ten times, uh, who was put at the bottom of a well in solitary confinement for over a year, staying sane only by talking to the beetles and ants. 
He is now the president of their country. He is beloved and lives sinfully. Although he says that if other, he asked others to live the way he did, they would kill him. So he does seek uh, economic growth for his people. But he also sees that the planet cannot survive if we are driven entirely by uh, materialistic impulses to consume. We have to change the fundamental structure of our system to not encourage consumption. Uh, consumption should be a, a side effect of our lives. It should not be the purpose of our lives. E.F. Schumacher, who wrote Small is Beautiful, this book right here, which I suggest if you read, will be transformative to you. I think I got that right. Economics as if people mattered. Wrote of Buddhist economics, the economics of a moral livelihood. Uh, and, the, and you cannot follow Buddhist teaching and precepts if you, for example, work as an arms manufacturer. Uh, he said that he could have called his writing Christian economics, but he jokingly stated, that, but then no one would have read it. These are the sorts of people we should admire and imitate, not the superficial oligarchy and its sycophants, such as the vast majority of people running Republican and Democratic parties. We have the example of Ron Paul, who said, if it came to being a little poor or a little more free, I would choose to be a little more free. I'm sorry, to, uh, uh, to be a little poorer and a little more free, he would choose that to be more prosperous and less free. Ron Paul does not appear to seek self-enrichment if you study his life, but lives in the world of ideas and philosophy and ethics. If we taught such things in our junior high schools and our high schools, how different the prospects of our society might be. My daughters have gone to a high school where it was a lot of mean kids, very, very much based on what you wore. Uh, and um, uh, they've now gone to community college uh, and they still have friends constantly falling out of the local high school here uh, because of just the incredible meanness of children these days, young people, at least in this community, I'm afraid to say. Ron Paul is a man who believes in limited government but he is not corrupt. That is why young students flock to him. There were saintly people in the past, such as R. H. Towney, who was a democratic socialist in England, who was revered for his socialism that was steeped in ethics. He was called the Christian Socialist, though he himself rejected this title. <clears throat> there are role models in the world of a life beyond materialism, on the left, in the center, and on the right. These are the people we must support. We must strive for spiritual, cultural, and philosophical wealth in our society. Material wealth can only get you so far. The blind worship of wealth is making chumps out of us. In my readings on these matters, I myself have begun to change. I do not think about the next car so often or the next purchase other than books and perhaps trips. So who will we have on the right to embody virtue and wisdom and incorruptibility? I do not know. I once hoped Ron Rand Paul, but he has said things I cannot square. What should he learn from his father? His father's appeal was that he was guided by his convictions, but the price of his authenticity was the political wilderness, although he certainly came quite close. On the left, we hope Elizabeth Warren is incorruptible, but we don't know. We know Bernie Sanders is, and we hope Jerry Brown will reread Small is Beautiful and listen to his Pope. And I ask you to stay away as far as you possibly can from Hillary Clinton. My name is Alexander Hagen. Good night and good luck.